If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31 with me. <coughs> Today I want to take a very popular teaching and turn it on its head and uh, expose the fallacy that saturates that teaching. And it's something that you may even believe right now. Maybe you've heard about it in your life and um, you, you carry this belief with you and it's, a, and it's a false belief. It's a false teaching. We're living in extremely uncertain times right now. <coughs> I think everybody's a okay with that statement right there. We are living in very uncertain times right now. People are afraid and they have questions. And I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. <clears throat> the world's getting worse, just like the Bible said the world would get worse. The world is going to get worse. But there are many people who are beginning to live their lives in the hypothetical. And I've had people call me even this week. People come and talk to me this week. We live our lives in the hypothetical so many times. What if this happens? What if that happens? These are hypotheticals. We don't know for sure what's going to happen, but what if this happens? What if that happens? And I want to urge every, every one of you, do not live your life in the hypothetical. Don't live there. Um, I want to show this verse to you, this, the background to this verse. Believe me, I put a lot of thought, I put a lot of thought into the backgrounds because um, the pictures that you see on the screen are part of the message itself. Uh, so I put a lot of thought into it. So don't think I've just absolutely lost my mind. But let's go ahead and look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek, for, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. God does not want us worrying about the what ifs. At the same time, at the same time, it is wise to look ahead and plan for the future. How do we balance those two thoughts right there? How do you balance those two things? He does not want us living in the hypothetical. What if this happens? What if that happens? Don't worry about tomorrow. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. At the same time, it is wise to plan for the future. It's wise to look ahead and plan for the future. So how do we balance those two thoughts right there? It's really important that at this time in our lives, we are able to balance those two thoughts. Don't worry about tomorrow. Okay, so should I not plan at all? No, it's wise to plan. It's wise to plan. How do I do that without worrying about tomorrow? Let's blend them. Let's, let's make those two thoughts make sense to everyone. I want to look at some of Moses' final words to Israel before he died. Remember, he doesn't get to go into the promised land. Of all the people that you would have thought may, would make it to the promised land, you thought Moses would have stood a chance. But Mo, remember, he doesn't get to go into the promised land on, on account of his disobedience against God. He was supposed to speak to the rock, but he struck the rock instead. So he is not able to go into the promised land. And he knows his journey is about to end. He knows he's at the end of his life. Look at Deuteronomy 31 and verse 1. Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. I want to highlight the fact that Moses has really nothing to gain at this point in life. You got, it's over. 120 years old. He says, I can no longer go out and come in. I'm sure there were a couple other things he was no longer able to do either at 120 years old. He is, I am no longer able to fill in the blank. I'm really getting up there in age. I'm 120 years old. And God says, I'm not, I don't get to go into the promised land. He really has nothing to gain. He's not able to go in and enjoy what he has fought so many years to be able to do, to go into the promised land. He's not going to be able to do that. He's lived 120 years of struggle for the most part. Read Moses' story. A lot of struggles in his history. He, his past involved a threat of death by the people he loved, and his future holds death. That's, that's where he's at right here. I've been threatened to be killed, even by the people I've been leading. And now my future, I know I'm about to die. That's all he's got. On the surface, he has nothing to gain. Nothing. But he speaks up anyway. He gives this final speech. Moses wants to leave the people of Israel with one last reminder before he closes his eyes in death. I want to talk to you one more time. Look at verse 3 of chapter, or Deuteronomy chapter 31. The Lord your God himself crosses before you. 
He will destroy these nations from before you and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said, and the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites in their land, when he destroyed them. Moses' first words of his speech here was that God was going into the land with them. That's a good introduction. You guys are about to go into the promised land and I want to start my speech out by saying, God's coming too. God's going to go with you. He doesn't shy away from the fact that there are going to be some tough times that come with it. But God's coming too. God's coming in with you. Yes, there's going to be struggles over there. There are a lot of them. A lot of rough times. But I just want to let you know God's coming too. So he starts his speech out. First thing he says is, before I say anything else, I just want to let you know God's coming in with you. He's coming to. Joshua has now been placed into the leadership position and he's about to take the people into the unknown. Not one of these people are aware of the stories that we are aware of. Not one of them. They don't know about Jericho's victory. If you were to go back in time, if you were able to do that, which I, nobody's figured that out, but let's, let's say we were able to go back in time and talk to them at this moment. Why are you so afraid? Haven't you read the story about Jericho? It hasn't happened yet. They don't know about the victory of Jericho. They don't know about that. They don't know about the day when God allowed the sun to stand still to assure their success. They didn't get to read that story. It hasn't happened yet. They're, they're not there. They're not aware of the many victories that they are going to encounter when they cross that Jordan River. They don't know those stories because those stories haven't happened. They don't get to go back and read what we get to read. Everything is still unknown to them. So let's put ourselves in their position. This is a scary moment. It's a terrifying thought. So Moses starts out by saying, hey, just to let you know, God's going with you. He told you to cross over and he's, and he's not just going to send you. He's coming with you. So Moses, the, everything is uncertain for them. Everything is the unknown. So Moses wants to tell them something that they can know for certain. God is coming with you. That you can lock in. God's coming with you. Yes, times are going to be tough, but there are going to be blessings woven in with the tough times. God's not going anywhere. That's the beginning of his speech. God is coming to, he's not going anywhere. They are going to face enemies when they go over there. They know that because this land does not belong to them. It belongs to them because God promised it, but there's a little bit of an infestation over there called evil, wicked people. And they've got to get those people out. And God says, I'll go in there and I'll fight for you. I'll, I'll, I'll come with you. But there's still a problem over there. We've got to go in and we've got to take the land and it's a scary thing. So they are going to face some enemies when they cross over. But God instructed them how to handle those enemies. Look at verse 5. The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded you. Now whether they engaged in battle or offered kindness was determined by the actions of the enemies. Okay? Uh, Rahab, you see why she got kindness. Her actions determined her outcome. So they, the, these people still have choice. It's not like God's not offering forgiveness and repentance. There's time for this. So, but their, their outcome's determined by their actions. But God has promised to go in with them and he has given them the instruction of how to operate once they're in the land. But this does not erase the reality of the moment. So let's, let's really focus on the reality of this moment. Place yourself into the shoes of those people at that time. The unknown is all they have. That's all they have. By the way, that's also what we have. Everybody know how this week turned out? No, it's Sunday. We don't know how this week turned out. We'll, I'll get back with you next Sunday. Then I'll be well informed of how the future looks as of this Sunday. But everything after, the, up, after this point right here is the unknown. It's, it's completely unknown. And that's all these people have is the unknown. They spent years in the wilderness watching their parents die before they could enter into the promised land. That's what they've been waiting on. They've been waiting on the first generation to pass away. The people who raised them are now dead. Just think about that. The people who raised this generation are now dead and Moses is not going to lead them any longer. He's giving his farewell speech right here. So mom and dad are gone. You can't rely on them for help. Mom and dad are gone. Also, Moses, the one who has led us all these years, 
He's no longer going to lead you anymore. He's stopping here and sending you in without him. They're living in an extremely scary moment. This is the reality. This is the reality. And I believe Moses was able to see the concerns on their faces and he decides to comfort them. I know everybody's afraid. I know you're about to go into the unknown. I, I know you're about to face something that you've never faced before. And everybody's terrified. So I want to I wanna comfort you. Look at Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Or uh, different version. I'm reading why I memorized. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He encourages them not to be afraid of their enemies. And remember, God's going in with you. God's coming too. These people are scared and rightfully so. Because they don't know what their future holds. They really have no clue what their future holds. So rightfully so, I think we'd all understand, we all can understand this is a terrifying situation. It would be scary. They've never done anything like this before. This is all brand new territory for them. They've never been through this before. Then Moses calls their new leader up. Uh, the story progresses here. In just a few verses of Deuteronomy 31, the story progresses quickly. Now Moses is calling Joshua up. He's going to pass leadership over to Joshua. So he calls their new leader up. He needs to talk with Joshua and he wants everybody to hear what he has to say to Joshua. Now the instructions that he gives to Joshua seem to be very similar to the instructions he just gave to the people. But this time he's giving the instruction to lead. But it's very similar. Look at verse 7 of chapter 31. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage. For you must go, must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. And you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. He encourages Joshua to take the lead. You're going to need to take the lead. I can't go with you. I'm not, I'm not able to go in. Joshua, you need to take the lead. God has prepared Joshua for this position and it's time for him to exercise his authority. It's time to go in. But he's getting ready to lead. But as he's getting ready to lead, he's reminded to lead with courage. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. This is one of the most important lessons Israel needed to learn. They needed to move forward with courage. You've got to move forward with courage. Have courage. Don't be afraid of them. Be strong and of good courage. God will not forsake you. It seems like Moses is really pushing this courage message a lot in this chapter. Don't be afraid of them. Be of good courage. God's going to come with you. These are people who have already determined to go into the promised land. Let's lock that in. They're already going in. Moses isn't trying to convince them to go in. They've already determined that they're going into the promised land. They're not trying to get out of it like their parents' generation did. They're not trying to do that. They've already determined that they are going to go into the promised land. So Moses isn't trying to persuade them to do it. They're already going to do it. Moses knows that fear is a powerful thing. It's such a powerful thing. And it can shut a person down quick. It can shut you down so fast. So to combat the fear that might be rising in their hearts, Moses teaches them to fight fire with fire. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of them. When you go in, they're going to be intimidating. The walls are tall. The cities are fortified. There are giants in the land. This is your future. Not good. This is a scary out outlook on the future. And Moses says, don't be afraid of them. Be of good courage. At the beginning of this message, I told you that I wanted to expose a fallacy that saturates a certain teaching. <clears throat> this teaching has the potential of weakening our faith. It makes us feel inadequate or unuseful to God. That's what this teaching does. And it sounds profound, and it actually sounds pretty reasonable, 
But when we examine it a little bit deeper, we find out that it is incorrect. Now I'm going to tell you the teaching, <clears throat> and then I ask you to write it out with me. Just stay with me. Write it out with me and give me a chance to explain why this teaching is wrong. Here's the false teaching. Fear is the opposite of faith. That is not true. That is not true. It sounds right. It does sound right. But it is not true. It's a dangerous teaching. Now I'm going to give everybody a pop quiz right now. I hope you've been studying because it's time. And this is happening right here, right now. Everybody studied up? Good. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and do the pop quiz. A couple simple questions, and I just want you to answer them honestly, okay? And go ahead and answer at the same time. Here we go. Just a little bit of interaction this service. Ready? What's the opposite of in? What's the opposite of up? What's the opposite of cat? Whoa, whoa, whoa. If you just said dog, you are absolutely wrong. You are absolutely wrong. You got the in and out, up and down thing. You got that. But when I said, what's the opposite of cat? The majority of people said dog. How is dog the opposite of cat? It's not, it's not the opposite of cat. A cat is a cat and a dog is a dog. It's real simple. Cat is a cat, dog's a dog. Fear is fear, faith is faith. They are not opposites of each other. We just attribute an opposite to them. We, what we do is we designate them as each other's opposite. But it's not true. Let's look back at the instruction that Moses gave in his speech. Let's look back at this. Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be, di or, nor be dismayed. That's the old King James, by the way, and you can look it up. I am quoting that correctly. But in the new King James, the word is afraid. I apparently just can't read it. Be, of, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. Another question for you. Who ate a donut when you came in today? Just raise your hand. We got quite a few donut eaters here. Okay, good, good. Whoever ate a donut, we got, we got a few of you around the room. Where did you find the courage to do that? Why are you laughing? I mean, that's a serious question. Where did you find the courage to eat a donut? Did you feel you needed the courage to eat a donut? No? Why not? Why didn't you need the courage to eat a donut? Because it wasn't scary. It wasn't scary. You guys had confidence and I know it. I watched some of you. You came in the door and went straight to the table. I, you, you had confidence. And I'm proud of you. The reason why you didn't feel like you needed courage is because it wasn't scary. You didn't need courage because there was nothing to be afraid of. Fear must be present for courage to exist. Do we understand that? Fear has to be present in order for courage to exist. Cour courage is not the absence of fear. It's being able to do something despite fear. I'm terrified but I'm moving forward anyway. People aren't usually given hero status because they ate a donut. <laughs> hero status is given because of an act of courage. That's how people get that status. Eating donuts don't require courage. Running into burning buildings to save somebody's life, now that requires courage. Because there's an element of fear, but they did it anyway. What we do is we say that's a courageous person. Not one of you looked at the other person this morning and watched you eating a donut. I'm like, man, I wish I was as brave as they are. No, you didn't take any courage. You didn't think that person needs hero status because there wasn't an element of fear. In order to have courage, there has to be an element of fear. In order for the Israelites to be of good courage, something fearful had to be present. Something had to be present that they were afraid of. Not only that, but God told them to be courageous. That was a command. Be strong and of good courage. You, I need you to be courageous. If I told you that sugar was sin, but it, that it was God's will for you to eat that donut you ate this morning, I think every one of us would be faced with conflict of interest. God's will is for me to eat that donut, yes. And by the way, sugar's a sin. We, we have a conflict of interest right there, right? We, we would, how do you move forward? 
How can sin be an ingredient to my obedience to God? Fear is often advertised as sin against God, but it's an ingredient of being courageous. You cannot be courageous if there's something that does not shake your world. Fear is not the opposite of faith. It's not the opposite of faith. Fear is an emotion that God gave us and, he, and, it's, and it motivates us to act. You don't take a ba bath with a toaster in your lap because you fear <laughs> what might happen if you do, correct? You, that, now, that fear motivates you to make a decision. No toaster. That's the decision you have chosen. Why? Because the outcome of the other decision, I, I fear that. I fear that. So I choose to take a toasterless bath. Because fear motivates you to act. Fear, God gave us, He gave us the ability to use our heads. Running into a fire is a dangerous thing. We can use our head and we know, okay, that's a scary situation. We're able to determine that. Fear can be a healthy thing. It can be an extremely healthy thing. And Moses knew that fear was present and it would make sense that it would be for these people. We're about to walk into a world we've never been in. Everything's changing for us. We don't know the future. We don't even know how the future operates, but we're going into it. And it's a fearful thing. So many people carry the burden of inadequacy because they, in, they experience fear. They're told that fear is the lack of faith. I challenge that teaching. Fear is not the opposite of faith. Fear in its basic definition, let me give you the basic definition of what fear is. It's believing that something is bigger than you and it has captured your focus. That is all fear is. I believe that something is bigger than me and it has my attention. It's captured my focus. Something is bigger than you. You cannot control it and it has your undivided attention. That is all fear is. That's what fear is. Now this word fear has been advertised as a negative thing and it's not. It's an emotion. Let me show you another time that this same word fear is mentioned in scripture. Let me show you this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. This is the same word that God uses when he tells us to fear not. Exact same word. Not only the same word in English, it's the same word in Hebrew. It's the same word. Fear not, fear God. Same word, same word. We're often taught that being afraid of something is to be scared and fearing the Lord is actually just being reverent to the Lord, right? We've, I'm not the only one that's been taught that, right? I'm not alone here. Being to fear something is to be afraid of it. But to fear the Lord is to be reverent, to see him as holy and to reverence the Lord. But they mean the same thing. It's the same word. It's the exact same word. When you are fearful of something, it's because you see it as bigger than yourself. You yield your mind and your emotions to that circumstance that you fear. It captures and it consumes you. This is exactly what God wants from us when he tells us to fear him. That's exactly what he's asking for. He wants us to see him as greater than ourselves. He wants us to yield ourselves to him. He wants to, us to be totally consumed by him. That's what he's asking for. Fear the Lord. I want you to see me as bigger than that problem. I want you to see me as more able than yourself. I want you to see me as something bigger that you cannot control, but you will yield yourself to and be consumed by me. Fear the Lord. That is what he's asking us to do. Fear the Lord. Fear is not failure or weakness. It's natural. It's natural. Your faith isn't failing when you fear. It's being examined when you fear. That's what's, that's what's going on. God tells us 365 times in the Bible not to fear. He's not trying to condemn us by telling us not to fear so many times. We just need the reminder. We need the reminder. He's telling us 
what not to fear, and then he tells us to fear him. Same word, fear me. The things we allow to frighten us are not big enough to be worried or worthy of our fear. L- let me say that again. The things that we allow to frighten us in this world are not worthy. They are not worthy of our fear. They're circumstances. They're small. Are they scary? Sure, then be of good courage. If something scary doesn't mean you're weak in faith. It means it's scary. Now be of good courage. Move forward. Move forward. What should, but I'm afraid. The question is, what do you fear? Do you fear what you're looking at? Or do you fear God? Because we're still going to have to move forward in the future. I, I promise you there's not another direction we get to go. Forward is it. When you wake up tomorrow, it will be Monday. It will be January 11th. You can't go another direction. There's only one way. And as you move forward, be of good courage. Be of good courage. What if it's scary? Be of good courage. But my fear, I hope it's placed in God and not in what you're seeing. Yeah, fear is going to be real. Give it to God. Place your fear in God. Fear is natural. God's just asking us to place that fear in Him. Place it in Him. These cannot be opposites of each other. You, like cat and dog. They are not opposites of each other. Fear and faith. They are not opposites of each other. We just designate them as each other's opposite. You know, nobody else gave another word other than dog. Why not elephant? It's just as much of an opposite as a dog is. But we've, we've designated a certain thing as the opposite of this thing. We've done the same thing with fear and faith. It, we, don't, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. God asks us both to fear him and to have faith in him. They cannot be opposites of each other. He's also not wanting us to be terrified of him or afraid. Let me clear this up. He just wants us to fear him in the, in the definition of seeing him as bigger, more powerful, and more able than ourselves. Fear me with that definition. I am bigger, more powerful, and more able than you are. Fear me in that. The last thing God wants is a relationship where we cower from him. He doesn't want that. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of sound mind. This fear is speaking of a cowardice or a timid behavior. God didn't give you a spirit of timidity. He didn't give you a spirit of cowardice. It's not what God's looking for. I don't want, you, I don't want that relationship with you. I want a relationship where you fear me because I'm bigger, more powerful, and more able than you are. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Just because we fear the Lord by recognizing that he's greater and more powerful than ourselves does not mean that we are supposed to be afraid of him. That's not what it means. We can have complete confidence that whatever we face, catch this, he's coming too. He's coming with us. Whatever tomorrow looks like, and I don't know what tomorrow's going to look like. Could be a great day. It's Monday. That's usually a bad day. Not because it's a bad day, but because we designate it as a bad day. (laughs) Oh, great, tomorrow's Monday. If it was Tuesday, we would say that was the bad day. It's a designation we give towards the day. But I don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow. I don't know how the news is going to unfold. I don't know how your health is going to unfold. I don't know if you're just having a great day and some um, catastrophe happens in your life. Or maybe... You find a lottery ticket that you didn't even purchase and you are the winner. I don't know how tomorrow looks. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know. But I do know God says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. It has its own troubles and today has its own troubles. Don't borrow them from tomorrow. Don't worry about it. You can't fix that anyway. Don't worry about tomorrow. Be faithful today. Be faithful today. Because of fearful events, there are people who have believed in God their entire lives, who are suddenly opening their, their eyes to the importance of knowing God. Praise God for that. That is a healthy thing. That's healthy. There are people their whole life, 
their entire life, they have believed in God. They've enjoyed the blessings. But right now, because of society right now, it's getting crazy out there. It's getting crazier and crazier. Now people are realizing the importance of not just believing in God, but knowing Him. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. As I said earlier, we cannot live our lives in the hypotheticals. At the same time, it's wise to look ahead and plan for the future. How can we balance those two things? What do we do to balance those? There's good news. God hooked us up with a recipe for this one too. He didn't leave us stranded. Look at what he says. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Everything I see is scaring me. Why are you living by what you see? Shouldn't you be walking by faith and not by sight? Walk by faith. How do you walk by faith? You understand that the God that you serve, the God who loves you, the God that gave his life so you could have eternal life, that God, he is bigger, more powerful, and more able than anything that might come your way. Fear the Lord. Fear God. It's not what we see that deserves our fear. It's who we don't see. He deserves our fear. Fear the Lord. God does not want us to live in anxiety. He tells us not to worry about tomorrow. But tomorrow looks scary. You're not there yet. What are you going to do about it? Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. If you're going to live a life of fear, do it the right way. Do it the right way. Look at Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord, there is a strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. I love that verse. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. Strong confidence. What if the world gets scary? It shouldn't have your fear. It doesn't deserve your fear. Fear the Lord. He's bigger, more able, and more powerful. He deserves your fear. Not to be afraid or terrified of him, but he deserves, he deserves your fear. I love this quote by Raymond Edmond. I love this quote. Never doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. Never doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. Did his promise change because the lights went out? No. Just because the world gets scarier, does that mean God's going to fall back on his promises? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He stays faithful. He's going in with you. He's going with you. Never doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. We love to hear God's promises when the future looks bright. We do love that. But when the ground gets shaky, we become afraid. We become afraid. It's not time to fear. It's, or it's, it's time to fear. It's not time to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. It's time to fear. Just make sure your fear is in the Lord. Make, place your fear in the Lord. Fear the Lord. He is bigger, more powerful, and more able than anything this world can throw at you he's bigger than all of it faith and fear can work hand in hand and they should they're not opposites of each other they can work together can't have courage if the situation is not scary and i'm sorry i took the credit and i stole the thunder from you by taking the courage aspect out of the donut you ate this morning but it doesn't take courage to eat a donut because there's no fear factor the fear there has to be fear in order for courage to be present. It's okay to walk into dark times. It's okay to move forward into a future that's shaky when you know that God's going to go with you. Place your fear in the Lord, not into the shaky circumstances. Fear and faith can work hand in hand, and they should. And by the way, God has a perfect running record. Not just an old record. It is a running record that God has. He cannot be overtaken. He cannot fail. He cannot fail. He does not grow weary. You cannot take him by surprise. And his victories always include his people. Always. That means he meant what he said in Jeremiah. Look at this verse in Jeremiah 29 11. 
For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God said this to the very people who were being taken or were taken into Babylonian captivity. Whole world got shaken up for that group of people. This is who he says it to. That means even with Satan's best efforts, we come out on top. We come out on top. But I don't want to end with this verse right here. I want to look at the next two verses in Jeremiah 29. Let's not just stop with this one. Look at what comes right after that verse right there. Look at verse 12 and 13. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. This is the responsibility of the children of God. That's your responsibility. In the good times and in the bad times, that falls on your shoulders. That is your responsibility. We walk by faith, not by sight. If it looks scary, look another way. Faith. Relationship with God. It's all about a relationship. It's always been about a relationship. Don't walk by sight because it can shake your world. It can become scary. Don't walk by sight. Walk by faith. We grow stronger by fearing the Lord rather than what we can see. You will grow weaker by what you see. If your fear is in what you're looking at, you can become very afraid. But if your fear is placed in the Lord and you're, you're walking by faith, not by sight, you grow stronger. You become stronger in that. Whether 2021 is a great year or it turns out to be the evil twin of 2020, which it could be, I don't know. We remain faithful. We must remain faithful. That's our job. That's our job. I'm looking forward to what God has for our church in 2021. I, I, I'm, I look forward to that. I look forward to growing in his word and working side by side with you faithfully. I, I look forward to that. It's good to have you here. Seriously, when I said earlier, when you walk in, it's a blessing. It is a blessing. It really stinks when you come into the building and you're all alone when there should be somebody here. But when you know that you've got people standing by you, moving forward faithfully, that is a blessing. It's encouraging to see that. We have nothing to be afraid of. But we do have a God who deserves for us to live in the fear of the Lord. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. The Bible says it's the beginning of wisdom. You want to know how to handle it? Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Maybe you don't know how to plan for the future. Our job is to be faithful to God in all that we do. Just be faithful. But what about what if, what if? Don't live in the hypotheticals. Who cares what if? We're not into tomorrow yet. We can't take care of tomorrow yet. Tomorrow, we get, we'll do it hands on. But we're not going to worry about Tuesday until we get to Tuesday. We're not going to worry about Wednesday until we get to Wednesday. Don't live a life of anxiety. Our job is just to be faithful. You do that in the present. You be faithful. Be faithful. Grow deeper. Grow deeper. We're starting a discipleship program. I encourage every one of you to be there. Be there for it. It's called growing deeper. We're not called to look like Christians. We're called to look like Christ. That was our calling. Disciples make disciples. That's our job. Can you do that in the good times? Yes, you can. Can you do that in the bad times? The truth is sometimes more effectively. Because people are looking for God in the bad times. So whether we move forward in a good, with a good future or a bad future, you've got one job. One job. Remain faithful. Remain faithful. Put your fear in the Lord, not in what you see. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Let's walk by faith. Can you plan for the future? I encourage you to do that. Do you worry about the future? I don't encourage that. Because when you worry about the future, you accomplish nothing today. Nothing. Don't borrow troubles from tomorrow. Don't do it. It's time to fear. It's not time to be afraid. Fear the Lord. Let's remain faithful. If the ground gets shaky, good news 
The ground wasn't holding him up, but he is holding you up. Don't put your fear in what you see. Put your fear in the Lord. And let's remain faithful. Let's grow stronger. Let's grow deeper in God's word and in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That is our job. No matter what it looks like, our job remains the same. Be faithful. Be faithful.